So you were supposed to listen to Anne Formentel uh, lecture, but in a way, uh, perhaps I, I am Anne tonight, or uh, Anne is speaking perhaps through me, and especially, you know, because my, my, um, my topic would be multiple pers personalities. So perhaps in a way, you know, uh, that's a kind of personality for me to, to well, to be Anne uh, tonight, but well, <laughs> it's, it would be hard, I guess. Uh, so <laughs> last year at uh, EGS, I gave a lecture about uh, the lie in, uh, in the philosophy. My purpose was rooted on uh, the contradictions between discourse and life, between what, between what some philosophers claim as theory and the way they act. And I proposed a psychological understanding of philosophical discourse without any moral judgment. I explored the fetishism of concepts, subjective investment in a thesis, and the metamorphosis of real life into a speculative discourse. Today, I would like to go further and introduce the notion of multiple personalities in order to explain this kind of gap inside a thinking subject. The identification of a philosopher with one's theory, concept, or system must be questioned. And Freud, you know, in his lecture, Über eine Weltanschauung, pointed out this paradox of philosophical discourses. They are supposed to be universal and anonymous, but they always refer to the name of a philosopher master. First of all, I have to define what we call life, personality, and name, because in spite of their obviousness in ordinary language, these words mean many different things. It would be too naive to believe that we know something about philosophers just because certain facts have been reported by biographers. A so-called life remains mysterious and its unity exists only because someone, an author or, or others, has given a narrative of what is supposed to constitute a human existence. So let's say that life as an individual ent entity doesn't exist in itself. Supposed personal facts or events are for the most part only anecdotes for biographies. What is more interesting is the unifying process in the different self images built by a subject thanks to different discourses. For the sake of efficacy, I'm still using subject here at my own risk, I know. <coughs> Philosophy is one of these discourses like fictions with a more complex strategy because it uses concepts rather than characters. By examining the contradictions within the personal identity given by a name, a theory or a life, we gain access to the phenomenon of multiple personalities. Names, names, theories, and lives function as sites for subjective identification, but they are constantly displaced in a process of division and of multiplication. Even though the author has been declared dead, we remain invested in the fiction of a life, despite or rather thanks to Barthes and Foucault, the living status of the author has been newly staged. We usually, we usually accept such a displacement in literature. Proust, you know, wrote a famous uh, essay about the different egos of a writer in the Contre Sainte-Beuve, i.e. against the illusion of a coherence between an author and his, her work. There is the human being and one's social identity. There is the author of books. There is the narrator of stories. There are the characters in which he or she is involved. And there is also the text, the language, the imaginary in which he or she transforms her or himself through signs and images. On the other hand, it's difficult to accept the existence of a multiplicity for a philosopher. We resist this idea because it would disturb our faith in philosophical discourse based on sincerity, authenticity, and the thinker's relationship to truth. Would a philosopher promote a theory without believing in it? It's hard to accept such a, such a proposition, except if we are talking about sophists. 
This resistance is based on the illusion that a, a genuine philosopher always keeps his thoughts under control. However, if we pay attention to the psychic involvement of a thinker with his thoughts, we can assume that a philosopher necessarily deals with multiple egos, ego components, and that the construction of these egos leads to multiple personality. I borrowed this notion of multiple personalities from the field of psychiatry. It was used during the 1980s to identify specific troubles. Some people changed the, their personality very quickly, uh, out of control, embodying different roles. And at that time, the, the, the media talked about an epidemic of multiple personalities, as if it were contagious. This diagnosis was introduced in the third uh, DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder, and finally deleted because of the weakness of this classification. In any case, this notion seems outdated now, but it still provides a huge potentiality to conceptualize the division and, the, and of the multiplication of the self beyond its psychiatric use. Of course, I wouldn't dare suggest any madness in philosophical discourse, but we can think of theories as constructions of a personality, i.e. as a fully lived existence. So today I will propose three scenarios of multiple personalities. First, anonymous personalities that are characterized by disappearing behind concepts. Second, reversible personalities that are characterized by adopting simultaneously opposite theories. Finally, experimental personalities that are characterized by multiplying theoretical existences. First of all, the anonymous personality. Let's talk about the notion of the impersonal in philosophy and of its ambiguities. In uh, Jens Seint uh, von Gut und Böse, Nietzsche uh, wanted to destroy the illusion of an abstract language in philosophy that could allow philosophers to disappear behind their concepts. I quote, all great philosophies have always been the confession of their authors, wrote Nietzsche. And you know that he defined himself as a psychologist seeking the personal interests of philosophers in their theories. He dis discredited the universality of concepts and pointed out the repressed and personal metaphors at work in, uh, in the rational language. These images come from philosophers' imagination, feelings, and sensations. Socrates or Kant <laughs> dealt uh, with their own psyche in their metaphysics. However, this provocation by Nietzsche doesn't mean that a unified ego is acting under abstract language because the ego is in itself a composition, a, constrict a construction of different drives. The ego, the I, and the self are just effects of grammar. Many forces and personalities are involved in a sentence like I think or I am I decide, something is thinking, Nietzsche prefers to say. And this something is even too sub substantial and too unified. So the personality doesn't correspond to what we usually call a self, nor does it correspond to a biographical identity. It's a temporary construction and a self-representation based on an abstract construction of concepts. Therefore, a thought is not the expression or the production of unified subjects, but rather the organization of anonymous forces and drives. And if Nietzsche chose to present himself as a singular ego, affirming and presenting himself in Exe Homo, he nonetheless assumes that this personality is a complex of drives and impulses. Following this Nietzschean conception of the thinking subject, Deleuze chose a different way to get rid of the concept of personal identity. He proposed the notion of the impersonal, claiming that philosophical production, i.e. the invention of concepts, 
is a mix of variations, sequences, encounters, grafts, and metamorphosis. That is why he claimed to disappear as an author in this theoretical process. He considered his own name as an arbitrary convention for publishing purposes, without any link to his personal life. He intended to blow up the idea of an intellectual authority of concepts. The pertinence of a concept comes only from its performance and its transformations in the other fields. But contesting authority leads to the question of responsibility. Is a thinker respons responsible for his concepts? Is he or she supposed to apply to incarnate his or her theories as a human being? At this point, a contradiction arises and an interesting polemic about Deleuze's philosophical and political proposals during the 1970s allows us to go further. One of his, one of his uh, unfaithful disciples, Michel Cressol, wrote a vitriolic text blaming Deleuze for the discrepancy between what he claims and what he lived. On the one hand, Deleuze in his work fights the familialism of psychoanalysis. He values schizophrenic minds and he supports nomadic ways of life. And of course, you know that nomadism became kind of trademark. On the other hand, Deleuze, in his life, got married at church, raised his children according to the symbolic order, and never manages to go anywhere because he hates traveling. <laughs> he, ha he, he is like those lyric actors on stage singing loudly, move, move, while staying still. Deleuze gave several interesting answers to this criticism. Uh, first of all, he gave a rational explanation of the meaning of what he calls, with, along with Guattari, anti-Oedipus. But he also argued that one doesn't need to be single, gay, and childless to think a way out of the Oedipal structure. There is no need to be a schizophrenic to talk about schizophrenia. But Deleuze went further by pledging a personal disinvestment in his concepts. According, according to him, a concept is valid not because it can lead to the truth, but because of its autonomous performance. We can then understand that a thinker does not exactly construct himself through his theory, but that he disappears in it. A philosopher thus makes himself, but also dismantles himself by projecting his mind in concepts. Sartre explained that thinking means breaking one's skull, crashing, crashing against one's own limits, breaking one's head against a wall. Deleuze, with the political language of the 1970s, said that making philosophy is like conducting guerrilla warfare, both against the power and against oneself. The destabilization of the self through philosophy, philosophy leads to a split personality to unstable, unstable identity. This kind of practice implies clandestine lives. It means that the thinker remains hidden inside his own thoughts, inside his architecture of concepts. Notions, signatures, proposals can play the role of screens or shields. Philosophers make use of this staging to become invisible. That was Deleuze's philosophical practice and aim, becoming imperceptible, living as a complex of intensities, escaping the individual ego, fading and disappearing behind his published name, always running elsewhere, recombining elements of himself by inventing new philosophical notions. That is what Deleuze called the vie impersonnelle, impersonal life. This depersonalization is far from the universal anonymous subject of classical philosophy. It involves a process of self-transformation, of self-division and self-multiplication. Even if Deleuze was devoted to multiplicities without personalities, I would say that this desire to, dis this desire to disappear into multiplicities constitutes 
in any case, a kind of multiple personality. That is a way to reconfigure oneself and live several existences simultaneously, because a definitive disappearance is, of course, a myth. It was a dream for Deleuze to live as a network, to be connected to many languages and realities. And writing with Guattari was a way to experiment with diffraction. He says, we wrote anti-Oedipus as two. Each of us was many, so it involves a lot of people. But this representation of a divided or multiple self is a metaphor that comes from a desire to disappear. The two thinkers wanted to get rid of the psychic topology of psychoanalysis. However, one can't disappear as a subject simply by proclaiming it. By proclaiming it. And if each of us is a composed of many personalities, what is most interesting is to understand the relationships among these different personalities. We can therefore read the so-called vie impersonnelle or impersonal life as a fantasy, a desire to escape from any identity. It is also an important argument about making and writing philosophy. It acknowledges the distinction between the author and the writer in philosophy. A theory can be understood as a performance or a role, even if the philosopher takes it, takes it very seriously. Even this philosopher believes, even if this philosopher believes in the truth of this theory. It means that philosophy is also a way of practicing multiple personalities by inventing a conceptual and psychic life and by traveling a lot without moving. However, we could doubt the reality of such an imaginary or conceptual life. Is this, is, is this just a fantasy, just a philosopher dream, living substitute lives thanks to his imagination or his conceptual inventions? Let's go a step further. Sometimes a philosopher um, lives different existences and theorizes them with different concepts and writings. And when these lives are contradictory, the multiplicity of personalities become obvious. So my, my second point will focus on antonymous personalities, double, double philosophical lives. In order to understand the psychic relationship of a thinker to his theoretical work, the notion of philosophical life has been recently discussed, thanks to historical studies about the practices of philosophy in ancient Greece. Pierrado, and following him, Michel Foucault, stressed that philosophy was not merely a speculative discourse, but a real way of life. Even the most abstract theories, like Aristotle's physics, were written in reference to a social and practical life. The notion of lifestyle or care of the self, have been promoted in order to create a shift in philosophy and to reset the question of life in philosophical discourses and practices. However, the description of these philosophical lives, those who of cynics, uh, stoics, skeptics, and so on, is based on a presupposition. Constructing oneself according to philosophy implies a coherence between thinking and acting. The exemplarity of philosophical lives is based on this continuity, on this ostensible unity of the subject and his rational constructions. We should certainly specify that a philosophical life is not exactly the same as a philosopher's life, and that it's fun it functions uh, only as a model. In any case, these exemplary lives are never questioned from a psychological point of view. For, for what reason a given human being chooses to adopt particular philosophical principle? Despite the urgent stances ranging from Sextus Empiricus to Schelling and Nietzsche, exhorting us to take into philosophical consideration the issue of personality, this subjective matter remains unquestioned. Adopting a philosophy of life certainly entails a self-construction, but it also allows one, allows one to hide oneself 
in comedies or tragedies to sublimate desires and dissimulate fears. A philosophical discourse can fulfill a narcissistic, a narcissistic need for personal unity. It provides, according to Ricoeur, a I quote, narrative identity or a theoretical identity for a thinker. But we must keep in mind that this identity remains fragile or is temporary and that it doesn't eliminate the multiple divisions inside the self, still acting alongside the rational discourse. That is why, rather than studying the harmony between life and theory, as exemplified by Foucault, for instance, it is much more interesting, I think, to look for the division and the contradictions in the self. I will base this notion of autonomous, autonomous, autonomous personality on the case of Simone de Beauvoir. The philosopher, indeed, wrote a very, a very important work in 1948, The Second Sex, that is not only the, the world manifesto for feminism, but also a philosophical treatise on consciousness, existence, nature, and freedom. While she was writing this voluminous book, around 2,000 pages, Beauvoir had a love affair with an American writer, Nelson Algren, and she wrote many books uh, relating this experience. However, the publication of her correspondence after her death caused a scandal because it didn't fit with the representation of herself that she had given before. Beauvoir appeared as a brand new person, another woman, not at all feminist, and utterly devoted to a superman. Let's just remember some arguments from the second sex. Beauvoir built an anti-naturalist philosophy to conceptualize free consciousness, open to existential choices. Neither nature nor biology manage human existences. They are only contingent data for a consciousness which gives a meaning to its own existence by orienting this data to a human aim. Being a woman means to exist and per to perform this role in the eyes of others. Beauvoir stressed this alienated self, the consciousness for the other and not for itself, of women, and she wrote many phenomenological descriptions of the so-called feminine behaviors, marriage, motherhood, and all the domestic activities such cleaning, washing, ironing, cooking, and so on. As a phenomenologist, she analyzed the shaping of consciousnesses through this home life, which she herself appeared to reject. Beauvoir readers, Beauvoir's readers were therefore shocked when they discovered the, this philosopher writing to her lover as she, she behaved at, at the same time, exactly at the same time, this was in 1948, 49, at the, the, the same time she wrote The Second Sex, like an alienated woman promising to wash his trousers, in the, the, the trouser, Algren's uh, trousers, cook his meals and clean his house, and even gladly. They were completely astonished by when they read passages like, I quote, I'll come to you and you'll see, honey, next time I'll be really nice and quiet and obedient like an Arab wife. <laughs> of course, we could consider these words as a, child, as a childish, if racist, game, and we shouldn't give credit to this, to this attitude that doesn't express the real Beauvoir. But some other letters in this correspondence of 17 years of hundreds of letters concern a more psychic content and one must pay attention to what seems to have been going on in this relationship. In the second sex, Beauvoir gave an amazing interpretation of love regarding gender and she analyzed the way women, when they are in love, are supposed to dissolve into themselves and to merge into a man's desires and life. A woman in love abandons her identity. She is no more an I, but a, a we, adopting the point of view of the beloved. The center of the world is no longer her own consciousness, 
And following the Hegelian analysis of the struggle of consciousness, Beauvoir argues that a woman exists only through the recognition of the male other. She developed it. an amazing chapter about the situation of waiting. In the absence of her lover, she feels lost, leaving an unjustified existence being nothing. Against this alienation, due to the way women are supposed to love, Beauvoir indicates a path of emancipation and freedom. To the contrary of this analysis, Beauvoir's correspondence sketches a theory outlining the ideal of merging lovers, of the we, without distinction. It's no longer, no longer a matter of recognizing two free consciousnesses, but their indistinct fusion. She writes the following sentences in English to her lover. I'm glad to suffer by you. I'm glad to miss you so badly since you miss me too. I feel as I were you and you were me. Another sentence. I'm a whole woman longing for you. I'm nothing else now but that burning, proud, impatient, and happy longing for you. Imagining that Beauvoir felt that she was a natu natural woman, achieving completion, claiming a total identity through a man, seems unbelievable, to say the least. There are different ways to understand such a troubling contradiction. Readers' reactions were terrible. Misogynists were happy to dismiss the feminist philosopher, and they considered the love correspondence as evidence testifying that Beauvoir was, in spite of her claims, a real woman, <laughs> according to nature. <laughs> On the other hand, feminist theorists felt betrayed. Some psychiatrists unhelpfully suggested a split between Beauvoir the mind and Beauvoir the body. <laughs> the, the, two, the two Beauvoirs living a schizophrenic behavior. Some psychoanalysts, Christeva foremost among them, say that Beauvoir divided her work between a phallic writing, her, uh, her philosophical work, the abstract language and the will to power, and on the other side, uh, narrative writings. But the weakness of all these interpretations is that they reenact the metaphysical dualisms that uh, they evaluate. I would suggest that the notion of multiple personalities is much more fruitful. The remarkable contradiction between the two types of texts leads us to think of a double life and even a multiple life through writing. We need to get rid of the idea of a real life. There is no reality on the one hand and writing, uh, <coughs> and writing on the other hand. Uh, writing is a real way of life, both expressing what is lived and prolonging it, prolonging it transforming it. A wrong interpretation would be to believe that the real Beauvoir resides in one of these versions. She's neither the alienated woman devoted to the he-man Algren, nor the philosopher playing coldly with her American lover as if she were trying out a girly script. Or better said, she's both the passionate, the passionate woman and the powerful philosopher, or the, pa and the powerful woman and the passionate philosopher, but at different levels, even at the same time. The disjunction between the love letters and the philosophical treaties written synchronously testifies to the availability of the self to invent, live, describe, and try out multiple personalities. And let me stress some uncommented characteristic of the two writings. They use different languages. Beauvoir wrote the second sex in French, that she wrote her correspondence in English, and that linguistic split means a lot. You perfectly know, I'm sure, that writing in a foreign language is not only a question of translation. It allows, maybe, <clears throat> forces one to think, to imagine, to feel through other experiences of words. 
Beauvoir has lived and thought in another language than her mother tongue. By experimenting with two languages, she doubled up her thought, secretly but profoundly. Writing in itself allows a subject to compose different personalities, thanks to the imagination, but also thanks to the theoretical prompts of language. And these invented personalities constitute both potential biographies and real lives. There, is not, there are no, <coughs> only few philosophers who assume the multiple personality. Beauvoir kept hers a secret. And it is still, of course, risky to avow, well, I'm not exactly the author of the theory. In a way, it really represents me, but not fully me. But it's difficult to keep the reader's confidence while saying that the author could be considered as a novel's character, living abstract existences and theoretical lives. Among them, Montaigne, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard. So my third proposition will stress the use of pseudonyms as indicative of a multiple personality. Even if the use of pseudonyms seem to belong to modern time, we could extend the meaning of this practice and consider that many authors wrote theories under the signature of another name. The name of Socrates could be considered as a pseudonym used by, to identify different personalities or characters described by Plato, Xenophon, Aristophanes, or Aristotle. Considering the name of philosopher as pseudonyms, <coughs> could we say, makes possible to read their works in a new way, getting rid of, uh, well, the cliché of their personality. More, <coughs> um, uh, because th this cliché comes from, uh, from the cultural historiography of philosophy. More recently, in the 18th century, the use of pseudonyms was an ordinary strategy to escape from the censorship. French philosophers, during the Enlightenment, wrote under different names, like Voltaire or Diderot, Readers didn't know the real involvement of them in the theories they exposed in their philosophical dialogues, unlike Socratic dialogues. It was difficult to identify a major thesis because each theoretical proposition was presented as an essay, an experience to be discussed. For example, uh, Diderot, Diderot's Rêve de d'Alembert, d'Alembert's Dream, is a dialogue exposing different materialist philosophies. Regarding the censorship, it would have been impossible to publish such a provocative text under the name of a well-known author. But Diderot's position remains unclear. <clears throat> he speaks through the discourse of each character, a physician, mathematician, as, as, as a physician, as a mathematician, as spiritual woman, and Diderot himself features as a character. But there is another use of pseudonyms that is closer to the multiple personality. When it comes from an existential choice, in this case, the name implies the full <coughs> psychic investment of a writer. It's not only a ploy nor a tactic, but a lived experience. experience. I will try to support this philosophical practice by means of Kierkegaard writing. <coughs> The Danish philosopher famously used many pseudonyms and multiplied theoretical propositions. He invented several characters of a philosopher and assumed the subjectivity of each of them. The claim for subjectivity in thought was an anti-Hegelian way to contest the disappearance of individuality in the objective mind. But beyond such a philosophical position, the use of multiple subjective positions leads to another conception of the thinking subject. Unlike Deleuze, Kierkegaard assumes the notion of subjective personality. He opposes subjectivity against the anonymous subject and its lack of responsibility. On the other hand, he supports a full commitment of the, of the author in his works. This practice could be seen paradoxical because of the multiple names that he used, how to be fully responsible to the work in different uh, personalities. 
a pseudonym should be considered as an existential experience and not only a tactical ploy. The incarnated selves involved in each other's, other's, uh, other's name are entirely lived, imported, importing all matters of subjectivity, desires, uh, affects, uh, imaginary. They borrow external experiences, they digest and transform them. These potential personalities open many existential and philosophical corridors. It means that they belong to the philosopher as virtualities that he or she realizes through his, through his thought and writing. These lives to which the thinking subject is committed aren't just pseudo lives, uh, but call on the fullness of emotions. Kierkegaard, indeed, thinks of himself as his own detective or spy, experiencing existences and philosophical propositions freed from the illusion of a central authority that would command all his personalities. Being one's own spy, staying suspicious of oneself and of what one is capable of saying, that could be the new definition of pseudonym. According to this conception, pseudonyms allow for multiple, multiple rearrange, rearrangements of the self. It doesn't correspond to what Ado and Foucault called style of life, because it radically differs from a, a conscious project of life looking for wisdom, balance, or perfection. Kierkegaard accepts, accepts the risk of losing himself when adopting new personalities. Living as a pseudonym could lead to illusions and misbehavior. This is a, a wandering life with moments of blindness and despair. Kierkegaard chose to leave them until their ultimate consequences, even if he tried to keep his faith in God. Doubting was not only a rational method, but also an existential experience. We finally don't know who Kierkegaard was through his multiple names and his effective truth. In 1846, he felt obliged to talk about his pseudonyms. I quote, I recognize that I am the author of, and then he recalled his books and the pseudonyms he invented, Victor Eremita, Johannes de Silencio, Constantin, Constantin, Joachim Climacus, Hilarius, and blah, blah, and so on and so on. Saying that he is and that he is not his pseudonyms. Quoting, quoting them with irony because he supported their autonomy, their own lives, without considering them as his sons. Usually, commentators try to unify all these characters in order to give a global interpretation of Kierkegaard's thought. They tried to isolate the, the period during which uh, Kierkegaard multiplied them. Indeed, Kierkegaard came back at the end of his life to religious text under his family name. But should we give full credit to his family name? Couldn't we consider the name of Kierkegaard as yet another pseudonym, the given name, the name of the father imposed by filiation and genealogy? Academic commentators are moved by quite always by a desire for unity, and they try to set a rational system where each pseudonym, each pseudonym would play a specific part. They feel uncomfortable with the division among different personalities. However, Kierkegaard himself refused any totalizing point of view on his work. Only God could eventually decide on his unity. And at the end of his life, when he wrote the point of view of my work as an author, he tried to explain his intellectual path and stages, but he gave up on this synthesis. I can't present myself under a truthful point of view. And he considered that only one of his pseudonyms could write up such a fiction. 
He also confessed that he often wrote theories in the opposite ways to what he was living at the same time. Perhaps like Beauvoir. <laughs> uh, for example, while he lived in a cloister, like an ascetic, he wrote the libertine text Diary of a Seducer. And while he, was, he lived as a dandy looking for superficial leisure, he wrote religious and mystic texts. And don't forget that this bachelor wrote a long text in praise of marriage. This disconnection uh, typified the, the multiple personality mold. It testifies to different levels of existence lived as a palimpsest of lies. So, in conclusion, regarding these three registers of multiple personalities, anonymous, antonymous, and pseudonymous, we must admit that writing philosophy deals with, deals with, with self-construction, besides or inside the rational work of thought. We must also assume that the thinking subject is divided and that different personalities are involved in the thinking of a thought. The authority is the result of a unifying process by which a subject identifies her himself with the concepts, the theories that he or she has built. But such an identity remains conventional. We should distinguish the thinker and the thinking. The thinker as an author is an effective identity, gathering many psychic forces involved in the disjunctive process of thinking. For this reason, claims of, of sincerity, authenticity, transparency, and clearness, and clearness must be seen as dubious. The thinkers who believe in their authority who are sure of their powerful control on their thought, are perhaps the most deluded persons, cheating themselves without knowing their duplicity. But those who are aware of this uncontrolled process try to reformulate and to rearticulate their relationships to the theories they are building, much like Montaigne, Nietzsche, Beauvoir, Deleuze, and many others. We might, we might describe the multiplicitous emergence in terms of voices. Multiple personalities are made up of different voices that are audible through the writing. The dominance of the master voice of philosophy prevents us from hearing them. The louder it is, the more it represses the multiple voices. Murmuring in the self. Nietzsche and Kierkegaard say that thought is a question of hearing. It requires good ears. And Nietzsche was proud of his ears. Very small, but the most acute of the world. Once the manifest identity of philosopher has faded, their voices can be listened to. Whispers, screams, songs, pleas and moans. The multiple personality is a kind of sound mixing. It opens the scores of thoughts to unsuspected voices. Thank you for your attention.